Welcome to Shield of the Republic, a podcast sponsored by the Bulwark and the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia and dedicated to the proposition articulated by Walter Lippmann during World War II that a strong and balanced foreign policy is the necessary shield of our democratic republic. I'm Eric Edelman, counselor at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, a Bulwark contributor and a non-resident fellow at the Miller Center, and I'm joined by my partner in all things strategery, Elliot Cohen the Robert E. Osgood Professor of Strategy at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and the Arlie Burke Chair in Strategy at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Elliot, great to see you. Uh, Great to see uh, you, Eric. I mean, we always say that, even though our listeners, of course, can't see us, but we can see each other. It's uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce our guest uh, today, who has had a long and distinguished career. It's uh, Tumas Ilvis. Uh, who received his education actually in the United States, but of course is a very well-known Estonian diplomat and politician. He was a, uh, among other things, was a journalist at Radio Free Europe, but then went into Estonian politics after the the Soviets left, uh, was Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, and then President of Estonia from 2006 to 2016, uh, known to, I think, people who follow him on Twitter as a wise and witty commentator on public affairs. And I have to say one other thing, uh, a man with an extremely distinguished and elegant collection of bow ties, which wins him a particular place in my heart. Tumas, really, thank you so much for joining us. And I, I believe you listen to Shield of the Republic. Every week. A, a further mark of distinction. It's great to have you here. It really is. And, you know, we both, Eric and I, I think, admire your, not only your forthrightness, but your insight on all matters European. I was wondering if uh, maybe we could just start off, if I could ask you about your take on the uh, recent Vilnius summit. What's your your view of it? Well, I give it a sort of a low B, uh, if I'm going to grade it. Uh, I mean, it Uh, It wasn't a C, but it was hardly an A. And in the B range, it wasn't uh, too high. Uh, I mean, I I thought that the that the language, uh, I guess it was point eleven, was was fairly wimpy. Uh, I thought uh, some of the sentences there, such as, uh, "Well, if we all agree, we'll take you." I mean, I don't have the thing in front of me right now, but. And we'll we'll follow your developments uh, in d- democratization, which I thought coming from an organization that has Hungary and Turkey in it was a little bit too much. I mean, I can imagine what the Ukrainians thought there being a uh, a fairly robust democracy, I would say. I mean, it's got it's messy, of course, but then again, I mean, it really, it really struck me that you'd be raising that issue for a country that has a democratically elected president without irregularities and follows rule of law and observes human rights. That maybe that should have been should not have been there. What is promised, of course, no one really uh, expected, and no one, I don't think, it was, I mean, no one really wanted anything as silly as proposed by some journalists maybe about uh, immediate membership. I mean, that was never in the cards, but a stronger statement uh, on that, well, when uh, we, when we, the war is resolved, then you will become a member would have been uh, much more welcome. And I think uh, left would have left the Ukrainians feeling much better. Um, uh, separate from the final communique, I think, ex- I mean, on purpose was the uh, the statement by the G7 was the was the uh, the place to then uh, give the security assurances, which then the sh- assurances uh, are not guarantees, but they were at least there was a shopping list of things that would be given to them. And now we can only hope that those things will be forthcoming. So I guess that was meant to sweeten the pot a little bit, or at least um, uh, eliminate some of the bitter taste of the final communique that really, as I said, was 
not anything really to write home about and probably uh, I bet there were probably people in the Kremlin going, thank God, it was so wimpy. Yeah, I think um, I think it's fair to say Eric and I would uh, strenuously agree with you on all that. I suppose the only little qualifier I might put in is the thing that struck me about the G7 is that, that there it was that forum, which of course includes Japan, um, which, you know, is one more indication that Ukraine is not just a European issue, you know, both the Japanese and uh, in a more forthright way, the Australians have engaged in it. And I think that's actually, that's significant. Um, I, I have, I had a different line I was going to go into, but Eric, did you want to say anything further about Vilnius before we move on? Well, I think there's a lot to say about Vilnius. Um, and I'd like to hear Tomas's view on, on a couple of the points. So first uh, I would say to Tomas's point about the sort of insulting nature in some sense of the language in the communique, which says that Ukraine has to, when the allies agree that certain conditions, unspecified, by the way, have been met, U- Ukraine will be admitted into NATO, which I think President Zelensky appropriately found insulting. This comes from an alliance that a few years ago admitted Montenegro as a member which I don't have anything against Montenegro essentially being a member, but it's a country that brings virtually no military capability to the alliance and which is riddled with corruption. And although corruption has been a problem in Ukraine, as Tomas noted, uh, there is basic rule of law. The talking points that the Biden administration has used on corruption in Ukraine are, I think, about four or five years out of date. Um, they're, They're not reflection of what uh, Ukraine has uh, become in, in the last few years. And even in wartime, I think they've made some progress against corruption. Uh, so I, not, you know, I'm curious about kind of Tomas's view here of, you know, he was saying that the language is pretty wimpy. When President Biden came into office, he made a point of saying, after the four years of Trump and the continuing denunciation of allies by Trump and whatnot, that the U.S. was back as the leader of the alliance. We were at the head of the table. And yet here we have a summit where, as we were talking in the green room uh, before we started this podcast, Europeans seem to be ahead of the Americans on a number of issues. I mean, on the provision of certain kinds of military capabilities, uh, on the question of Ukraine's path uh, to membership, Uh, quite striking that the U.S. was really pretty isolated at this summit, along with Berlin, to to be fair. And the one thing I think you can say they did well was, and Tomas, I'd be interested in your views of this because it's, uh, you know, close to your home here. I think they helped manage the Swedish accession issue reasonably well. That's the one thing I would give them, you know, points for. I think you're being generous, giving them a sort of, you know, low B. I mean, to me, I got a gentleman C, you know, which is, you know, they didn't fail, but it wasn't really a success either. But that's grading on a curve because I think, as as you know, Tomas, you know, every NATO summit is fated to succeed, you know, so they're built to succeed. So anyway, I'd just be, you know, those are sort of random observations. I'd be, you know, happy for you to comment on any or all. Before you respond to us, I just have to tell you that Eric teaches a course called Diplomatic Disasters, and <laughs> and 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 I know uh, I know that the students in that class kind of quiver in terror at his grading. So you know, the White House is not the only ones who are kind of feeling the lash of Professor Edelman here. That, that's because Elliot team taught the course with me, which he hasn't told you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the B actually comes from the the Swedish uh, the, the resolution of the Swedish issue uh, that that was handled more smoothly than I feared, um, and also well, we'll we'll see what happens since Erdogan said that well he's going to present it to the Turkish Parliament in October, so we have three months to go, um, and who knows what provocation some. Some Russian proxies will, um, whether they'll burn more Korans or do something else uh, that, um, I mean, 
we've seen it twice already and both times uh, eliciting quite a negative response in Turkey. And so uh, we don't know what will happen between now and then. Um, but it was heartening also to see that Hungary never wanting to be last, but stalling on Sweden for all this time said that they would take up the uh, the vote in September. So, but the, but handling the, um, Handling Sweden without any real embarrassing moments, I think, was uh, was sort of raised the raised the grade. Could I ask you a a different kind of question? So one phenomenon that again we were talking about in the green room um, seems to be that the I mean the frontline states, including Estonia, of course, but you know also Poland and the other Baltic states and so on, ha- have always been, I think, extremely hard line on Russia, and they feel appropriately vindicated by what we've all seen. But one of the things that is striking going into Vilnius is that a number of the Western European states, like France, which now says it's in favor of NATO membership, or like Netherlands, which is actually kind of took a bit of the lead in pushing for F-16s for Ukraine, now seem to be leaning further forward than the United States. Again, the the French now giving long-range missiles to uh, Ukraine, while well, where the United States is still dithering about supplying ATACMs, which is really something that the Ukrainians urgently need. So I'm curious, and and even the Germans seem to have moved from yeah. in some important ways from yeah, certainly from where they were. Before that, also the Italians, everyone and the Italians. Italians. So how do you how do you explain that as somebody who's you know not, observes all of Europe and the United States and not just your corner of it? Well, I see that there's a fundamental co- uh, conflict here between the empiricists uh, who are who have, ex- who have real experience with Russia and who unfortunately sort of go through uh, uh, sort of trauma uh, every time they read about Bucha because they know what it's about, uh, having similar events in each of the countries that are most pro-Ukrainian. And now you saw added the Nordic countries that um, had been kind of, well, I guess were galvanized by the uh, by the invasion. And of course, the UK, that formed kind of an arc from the UK to the Nordics and then down Central and Eastern Europe uh, uh, of people who didn't share the kind of uh, neo-Hegelian view of the uh, of this perfect future that we're all working on and that will will arrive. Um, France, I, I, think, I, I don't know about the Netherlands. Uh, in the case of France, uh, I think that Macron realized that uh, 30 years of French standoffishness uh, regarding uh, Central and Eastern Europe uh, has... Um, I mean, would have to end if they would have any hope for anything, anything uh, uh, approaching autonomy, strategic, because you're not going to get that with, uh, with by alienating and calling East Europeans hawks and warmongers. Um, and I think that finally dawned on on uh, on Macron that. They had, he had to switch something. It was only three months ago that he was accusing uh, accusing the East Europeans uh, in the European Union of being hawks that he disagreed with. So, uh, so I think there, there's a slow shift uh, and never underestimate the French, uh, uh, French seeing an opening of where the U.S. is behind the rest of leaping into the breach to... To take the here on Bastille Day with the with the tricolor going to the barricades of Eastern Europe, uh, there is a shift, and this is and to go to the United States side, where I mean, this is I mean, let's face it, the United States has been has led all enlargements, uh, at least all the ones that I have been. Uh, I mean, well. I mean, I would say beginning with the ninety with the ninety seven summit that was pushed by the U.S. and then the twenty two thousand and two summit and then subsequent summits that led to enlargements. It has been 
in the interest of the uh, the United States to bring liberal democracies into the fold. And 20 years ago, I remember speaking to some people in the United States who said, well, uh, the, the big nut to crack will be Finland and Sweden. Um, well, that was done now. I mean, it was, but that was again, driven by the Swedes and the, and the Finns themselves. They were the ones who pushed that. Uh, Particularly the uh, Finns. Yes. But so I am, I'm, and so I'm struck by uh, how, uh, how cautious and hesitant the U.S. has been on Ukraine, which would be the greatest addition to, to war fighting capabilities in NATO that NATO has had since its founding, since you have, you have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who have actually fought the Russians. No one else has. So why would we be so cautious? You know, you know I think w- one part of the answer is, and you know, in the way you alluded to it early on, is that for some reason, the administration seems to think of admission to NATO as either a um, sort of an indulgence or a gift or an act of compassion, or it's like being admitted to a very snooty club where you have to show good pedigree and clean shirt collars and immaculately shined shoes. And um, as opposed to framing it the way you have, which is uh, you know, a powerful addition to the security and stability of Europe, which is a, a major interest of ours. You know, one of the things that is striking, of course, is that Vilnius was in Vilnius, that it was in uh, one of the Baltic states. Um, and I wanted to ask you, and particularly given your experience as president of Estonia and then before that foreign minister, it does seem to me the Baltic states, but actually particularly your country, Estonia, have been able to exercise leadership and a kind of moral pressure, which is not commensurate with their actual size. I mean, the population of Estonia is what? 1.3 million? <laughs> yeah, 1.3 million. Okay, so very small country. Well, so what explains that? Or first, do you agree with that? And then secondly, what what do you think explains it? Well, I think the ability to articulate um, a position without appearing like an East European with his hair on fire uh, is what uh, has helped us. I mean, I mean, tough, but not going overboard as some even non-Baltic countries have gone. I mean, I would say that sort of demanding reparations from Germany right now is not exactly a way to inf- <clears throat> win <laughs> influence people. Um, And so I think that's part of it. And Estonians do tend to be more taciturn and and choose their words. And I think much of it actually has to do uh, nowadays with Kaya Kallas, who is extremely articulate and smart and well-read, combined with her own family history, because if people don't know among the listenership, I mean, in 1949, so four years after the war, there was a mass deportation in uh, in the Baltic countries, uh, March 49, um, nothing to do with anything except uh, just to punish people, I guess. And so in that mass deportation, um, Kaya Kalas' mother was the youngest child to be deported. So that kind of left a a mark on the family. And moreover, the family was throughout the Soviet period was not allowed ever to go back to um, where her mother was from, which is also five kilometers from where I live today and way, way south in the middle of the southern Estonian woods. So I think that uh, sort of personal experience and also the, the ability to articulate a position is something that has helped Estonia, and uh, I look when I look back on the uh, successful diplomats uh, and policymakers in the country, uh, they all generally fit into the mold of being tough, but not overboard. Uh, and that's, I mean, I think we saw very clearly that um, being uh, overly, uh, well, being hysterical 
did not help the, your case. You had to really make it in a way that people understood. Now, that said, I would say that uh, we have exhibited probably uh, uh, over the years uh, better than others uh, or articulated better than others uh, position on, say, Russia. On the other hand, let's face it, the uh, the we're not we're not big countries and we don't have that kind of clout within either the EU or NATO. Uh, I think that role is being taken up today actually by Poland, um, though, I mean, I think they could do better on the uh, articulation side in terms of um, maybe, as I said, maybe not going for reparations from Germany. So I think, I mean, it's a mixed bag. And they also it depends on the government. I mean, you know, the Czech, the, the Czechs were in pretty bad shape when they had uh, Zeman there. And, uh, and uh, when you, uh, Slovakia, when they had Fico there, who was also fairly Russophilic, that also did not exactly endear them. And then, and then you have, well, you have uh, Hungary for the past, I don't know, 15 years, uh, which is, um, of unabashed Russophilia. So, well, I don't know, Russophilia combined with uh, uh, sort of uh, some kind of bonding with the far right in the United States, which also is beyond, uh, it's bizarre to me. Uh, so that leaves not too many people to be able to express that something. Now, the other factor I would also bring in is that, that explains some of this stuff is that and also some of the sort of hysterical responses in parts of Eastern Europe is a real difference between how Russia treat, treated East Europeans after the fall of the wall and after after the breakup of the Soviet Union compared to the Western Europeans. A, a real big difference. Um, and I know, Eric, you were in Finland, so you probably could observe that Everything was sweet and light with the when the Russians talked to the Finns, but um, but when they talked to us, then it was sort of uh, you know, banging the fist on the table. And our best example of this was when we when we had our border negotiations with Finland, uh, rather excuse me, we, when we had our border negotiations uh, with Russia. I propose that we give we give to the um, Russians that uh, who wanted a simplified border agreement that we simply take a um, the the Finnish Russian border treaty and just use the replace function so that everything that applied to Finland and Russia would apply to us in Russia. To which Ambassador Svirin, who led the negotiations, said, "You are not Finland." You never <laughs> were Finland. You never will be Finland. No. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's so. The, I mean, so while they were being very, you know, Lavrov was being all uh, cosmopolitan and uh, and sophisticated in speaking with uh, his counterparts uh, in Western Europe and in uh, the United States. Uh, when he talked to us, then it was really pretty Stalinist. I wonder, Tom, if we could talk a little bit about uh, what uh, you think the impact will be inside the alliance of having Finland and Sweden in. Uh, you know, I, you know, of course, I'm biased because I'm, a, as you pointed out, a former U.S. ambassador to Finland. But I think in Washington and in the U.S. generally, there has been an underestimation of the strategic importance of having Finland and Sweden in, uh, not least because, of course, it helps enormously with potential defense of the Baltics by creating a kind of strategic hinterland uh, from which to reinforce uh, all these new defense plans that NATO adopted at the Vilnius summit, for instance, to be able to move forces forward more quickly. The fact of Finland and Sweden being in is going to be enormously helpful uh, in, in that regard. The ability to close the Baltic uh, and bottle up the you know Russian Baltic fleet, the serious defense industry that Finland and Sweden bring, the fact that there's you know serious countries with serious governments. I mean, I've been struck throughout the 
war in Ukraine by the tone of the statements, not just by Kaya Kallis, as you pointed out, but by Sana Marin when she was prime minister of uh, Finland, but also now Foreign Minister Valtanen, just in the last 24 hours, made a point very similar to Elliot's that, you know, Ukrainian membership in NATO is not a gift and our assistance to Ukraine from NATO is not a gift that the Ukrainians are fighting to defend NATO. This is from a country that's been in NATO for all of three months, right? So I, I'm just curious what you think the impact inside the alliance will be of having Finland and Sweden in. Will it shift the debate a, a bit? How do you see that playing out? I think a lot of things will happen. One is that, in fact, the Finns have, as you know, have had uh, for ever since, well, throughout the Cold War, had a really good military, which they have kept up with universal conscription, which I think also adds a lot to the cohesion of society. So sons of fishermen serve next to sons of professors which makes a which adds to the cohesion in that society um and finland and sweden rather has now come out of a long period of of basking in the <clears throat> peace dividend uh i mean they got rid of uh all troops on the most strategic place in the baltic sea which is the island of gotland from which an ss 300 can cover every capital uh, in Northern Europe, uh, which would make, so with no troops guarding it, it would have been like an ideal Spetsnaz place to attack. So that is, okay, that we get rid of those problems. Um, Sweden was a little slow in recognizing things because on uh, there was the Good Friday attack in 2013 when uh, Russians sent uh, bombers uh, escorted by uh, fighter planes to attack uh, Stockholm veering off right before they reached the uh, reached the territorial waters, which no one, <clears throat> which the Swedes did not pick up because it was Good Friday and they had sent their their, their radar people home. So it's it's a big jump. Whereas that would not have happened in Finland. Uh, so you have their capabilities, which are uh, which are great, and the Swedes, of course, produce their own fighter planes and artillery. Uh, and the Swede and the Finns have their uh, their uh, well, you know, armored cars or armored personnel carriers rather, which are sort of used throughout Europe. Uh, so that's that side of things. For from a strategic point of view, of course, right. There, I mean, Gotland has now been taken off the table. The I mean, you could think really strategically that the three Baltic countries were a, a spit, a peninsula, but it may be more like a spit with basically sort of defense depth of 250 kilometers, which the Russians in Ukraine covered in a matter of hours, really, or days. And so that has always been a weakness on the part of our uh, of the three Baltic countries. Uh, in NATO, especially being potentially cut off at the Suwalki corridor between Belarus and Kaliningrad, which is only 60 kilometers or 40 miles wide. So, I mean, if you think about what could have happened. Now, that 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 is completely obviated now. There is no problem uh, with uh, Finnish and Swedish membership for, for well, that, for supplying troops, for supplying for defense, and so it really is becoming a NATO lake, and um, this is, I think, a huge step forward strategically. Uh, attitudes, of course, you both in um, in both uh, Finland and Sweden, you have right of center governments now that are not overly burdened with the. Um, with the pacifist uh, 60s and 70s uh, leaderships that were, uh, well, Sweden was decidedly non-aligned. Uh, Finland had some uh, some uh, fairly anti-American leadership uh, for many years in the form of Tarja Halonen and Erki Tuomioja, the foreign minister. So it was. Uh, it was. I'm sadly aware. Yes, I'm sure you are. 
So, I mean, you see that there's been a shift there, uh, and I'm sure that uh, actually the um, I'm sure that actually the the election results last year and um, uh, or this year in uh, Finland and Sweden were also affected by the by the invasion of Ukraine, where suddenly the uh, those two countries realize that they are in fact vulnerable in their assumptions about sort of uh, being smarter than everyone else and being neutral uh, was was quickly disabused by Russian behavior. Yeah. Can I um, shift us a little bit and uh, see if we can get you talking about two other countries, one of which you lived in for quite a while, uh, you know the language fluently, that's Germany. And you know, what, what do you make of how much of a change there's been in Germany? I mean, if there's one country that, uh, you know, I think bears some responsibility for how we got to where we are, uh, it is it is Germany. And then actually we should talk about Russia and your view of uh, the Russian future and what do you think is going on there? But maybe we could start with uh, Germany. Well, I think the two most notable things about Germany, first of all, is the um, is the strong transatlanticist position uh, advanced by the Green Party, which, I mean, that's been a long-term transformation. I mean, even Joschka Fischer, despite his kind of 1960s uh, street-fighting man kind of uh, role uh, already was uh, 20 years ago was uh, decidedly transatlanticist uh, in his positions. And the party has uh, long ago uh, abandoned the kind of knee-jerk pacifism that I knew in the 80s when I was there. Um, So that's one change. The other change, which is not at all so pleasant, is the astounding rise of the AfD which is the uh, the hardcore right wing party that now is uh, well they're I mean they're almost at the level of the social democrats and uh, in popularity uh, and the well the most popular party right now is the the right of center CDU uh, which is um, I mean it's it's also kind of a split party between the one the the right that wants to uh, that is traditionally for NATO and for defense, and then the others who are very mercantilist in that party. So I mean, it's a mixed bag. You can't really ascribe to any party that you know the kind of view that you would you would in the U.S. context. So you have right you have Greens that are very pro-American. You have conservatives who are uh, who are very pro-Russia. I mean, it's just a bizarre mix there. Though, again, U.S. also now has conservatives that are pro-Russia. Um, so it's hard to say. I mean, I think that um, uh, I, I think that the, the Chancellor Schultz is um, the, he was not ready for this. Uh, I mean, for this invasion. And I think he's had to go through a through a lot of learning in terms of where, what Germany is and what Germany needs to do. I mean, it's basically been a laggard since the wall fell on uh, anything relating to defense. And during Schroeder's time uh, as chancellor, uh, they really went sort of downhill on defense and on um, also, I mean, Sort of looking in domestic security. I mean, sort of. There was a lot of there are a lot of Russians in in uh, <clears throat> Germany today with uh, who still have seem to have uh, strong ties to to the to the Russian regime, uh, which is the, you see in these you know mass demonstrations of people in Germany supporting. Uh, supporting the invasion of Ukraine, which it, if nothing else gives a lie to the notion that, well, Russians are only don't have all the facts. So you have people, you have three million Russians in in Germany who have all the facts because they're living in a free media environment. On Russia, you know, I don't know. This is, um, I mean, my secret hope is that, um, as I said the other day, that. Farce returns as history because it seems like 1916, with the uh, with the generals uh, going into revolt and 
but in any case, for, from the Prigozhin um, uh, incident on, it's they they seem to be headless. I don't know. Can't tell what's going on. Yeah, I could just back to Germany for one second then before we go to Russia. I mean, do you? Th- it it seems to me that there was a kind of deep consensus in Germany about a more or less accommodationist um, posture towards Russia. You know, you cannot blame it all on the SPD. Angela Merkel certainly pursued it. Right. You know, and then you have Schultz, who, as you say, you know, was not prepared for this in the slightest, says we have a Zeitenwende. There's a kind of a major turning point. And I, I wonder if you think at a kind of a deeper level, whether it's, you know, policy elites or or in fact the entire population there's just a a fundamental shift of attitude or not and of course what part of what follows from that is you know will germany be able to play a different role in european security than it has uh for the last 20 30 years well the opinion polls show actually germans to be more pro ukrainian than the government yeah which is um well uh... <laughs> I mean, usually when you get those kind of results, then the government kind of shifts to to go with the uh, to go with the people, and I think that is driving things somewhat. I mean, Pistorius is a far, far, far more serious to, uh, minister of defense than his uh, predecessor Lambrecht, who really I don't think ever got the message on the Zeitung then. So. I think it's moving. Uh, I don't know how much it's moving. There's this whole battle going on and what should be the relationship with China, with policy discussions uh, on top of everything else, um, the, including the, I mean, on top of the war in Ukraine, you also have this issue fight between the uh, the mercantilists and the, the other people. And how, what is our approach to China? Um, and that has not been resolved yet. Um, uh, I mean, that's a problem that actually faces much of Europe. Is what what should be the European position on China? Um, and it's becoming clear to many countries in Europe, UK, France, Germany, that uh, that it's all not. It's I mean, the kind of it's it's not all based on trade. There are some serious threats there. On on Russia, um, do you? I mean, is it your basic expectation? And then I'm really asking you as an Estonian, I suppose, former Estonian policymaker, but you're quite influential. I mean, is, should the basic assumption on which Estonia operates is, you know, no matter what happens in Russia, we, we will be permanently stuck with this big, predatory, imperialist, ruthless, um, aggressive state forever. And we just have to figure out how we're going to deal with that. Is it, would that be, or do you think that Russia will ever transform itself into something that's a bit more reasonable? It's the former. I mean, yeah. to be frank, I mean, yeah. um, I think that, um, I think the general attitude was the kind of uh, Clinton approach to Russia was naive and overlooked a lot of things. Um, and that, um, uh, and the hope that uh, trade would, I mean, well, I'll put it this way, that the, I think the, the big problem is that people thought it was communism, that it was means of production. It's not means of production. I mean, there is a fundamental nationalism there, which we should have seen uh, already with, on the part of Milosevic, who was also a, a, a person who got rid of communism. He became a capitalist, and then he started committing genocide. Um, I mean, this is this is the the problem that um, that you know, sort of economics does not determine sort of everything. I mean, it, there may be a state ideology, but uh, but in terms of um, the behavior of Russia in as the Soviet Union or as Russia today in Ukraine is not very different. Uh, and the, sort of the, and I would even argue that communism or sort of you know sort of internationalism, as they call it, had kind of a ameliorative effect uh, on the non-Russian republics of the Soviet Union, 
And that uh, once that went away, once there was no more communism, then sort of you get you got full bore uh, Russian chauvinism uh, with kind of statements that would, uh, I mean, just uh, with attitudes about you know genocidal positions that we will liquidate these people. They will they all have to die. I mean, this is you know you couldn't have said that as a communist, right? I, I wonder if we could talk maybe just, I mean, you and Elliot have just been talking about kind of Russia in the long term. I wonder maybe we could just focus for a minute a little bit more in the short term. You talked about, you know, Prigozhin's rebellion. Putin's been out, you know, uh, on television and it, to some degree traveling a bit around Russia to try and project the notion post Prigozhin that everything is fine. I'm in charge. He just leaked. Uh, they He just leaked. He, he said to Commerçant, uh, last night in an interview that he met with all the Wagner guys and he offered them all these things to go back to, you know, fight for Russia, blah, blah, blah. Um, in the meantime, though, we, we see in the Wall Street Journal today that more Russian officers have been detained for questioning. Uh, some have been released, but some not. Uh, Surovikin hasn't been seen in three weeks. Uh, there are reports, I don't know how much stock to put in them, that he's been tortured, that he's been beaten, and they can't show him on TV because there's visible evidence of that. Uh, General Popov uh, gave an interview in which he, you know, ripped up uh, Garasimov and Shoigu for mismanaging the war. Um, his wife now says he hasn't been, been in contact with her for, you know, some period of time, a couple of days. All of which seems to suggest that the Prigozhin rebellion, whatever it represented, isn't over yet. I mean, the phenomenon isn't over yet. It reaches deeper into the military than uh, might appear on the surface, which does open the prospect, I think, uh, potentially of splits inside the Russian elite that might lead at some point to, you know, uh, Putin finally, you know, cutting his losses and thinking he's got to at least temporarily stop this thing. What do you make of all that? Well, that's why I mentioned 1916 before, because it's um, as far as repeating as history, which is that, I mean, when you saw 1916, uh, the dismal state of affairs on the on Russia's Western Front led to generals beginning to, well, not quite revolt, but uh, I mean, uh, lose faith in their in the in the in the in the in the government or the regime. And right now, I mean, there's, there's a fair bit of uh, dissension, it seems, among the military and also the, uh, the military bloggers or mill bloggers who um, kind of are the mouthpieces of the, of the military. Uh, that's not necessarily great because they, they make Putin seem like a sort of a, a tame person. I mean, they're not very, uh, they're fairly bloodthirsty. So uh, you have this, um, I mean, it's hard to say what could happen. Clearly by, uh, by uh, making, uh, well, by being buddy-buddy with the Prigozhin people is so out of character and with what Russians are used to, uh, where, I mean, you know, if you uttered a peep before, you'd be flying out a window. And now this is, um, I mean, this certainly shows Putin as being fairly weak because everyone knows what his what used to happen. And so here, first you call it treason and then, and then you're uh, sitting around and um, having meetings with not only Prigozhin, but with, you know, 24 of his top guys. We don't know. I mean, there could be kind of like a, I mean, there could be retribution could come later, but right now I think it's a very confusing picture for everybody. But from what I have heard from my various contacts is that this dissatisfaction with um, with Putin is, well, mainly with Gerasimov and Shoigu, but that extends to uh, Putin, is much more widespread than the than the the people who have been detained right now. You know, one of the uh, things that I think one occasionally hears out of the American administration is, well, uh, we don't want, uh, you know, you don't want chaos in Russia. You, you know, you wouldn't like there to be uh, 
you know, real internal fighting and stuff like that, that we should be worried about Russian instability. Do you share that view? No. Uh, I mean... Uh, God, I was hoping you would say that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, since the justification for doing nothing uh, with, uh, with Russia for so long has been, well, um, that, well, it could get worse. I mean... There was a there was a cable from I think Ambassador Bullitt in like 1945 yeah. about well yeah. you know we have to support Stalin otherwise the hardliners will take over. So I mean I, I mean it's not really I mean we've tried this one approach and I think I mean I think the real fear in uh, in uh, in too many places in in within NATO is that we you know. We don't want the Ukrainians to lose, but we don't want Russia to lose either. And so that's, um, I mean, I remember Condoleezza Rice said like, I don't know, 20 years ago that she fears uh, a weak Russia more than she fears a strong Russia. Uh, I disagreed with that then, and I disagree with it today. I think that, well, Russia has to deal with its own problems. And that doesn't mean a civil war all across the, um, the across the Eurasian landmass, but certainly they have to be forced to deal with their own problems. And I think that they should uh, we should give them a time out and like figure it out, guys. Yeah. Well, for for the record, uh, Eric and I both want Russia to lose, and we prefer her weak. Could we turn to maybe a, another topic? You know, we in the green room we had had a conversation about. About, about the nature of Europe and how some West European states felt, and I, you know, I certainly think this is right, that you know they had somehow had an assumption that Europe now ended at the Elbe. Well, it's been over three decades since the, since the wall came down. I wonder if you could just reflect a little bit on um, the way in which what we used to think of as Eastern Europe has now just become Europe. It's a very slow process. Uh, I mean, it's it's a third of a, it's more than a third of a century, and they still refer to the former Soviet bloc. I mean, I was uh, I was uh, had already graduated college, um, which is the same amount of time since I graduated college. I mean, in World War II and when I graduated college, when the wall fell and now. And when I graduated college, I did not read articles talking about the former Nazi Reich. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, so uh, and uh, I, I don't think that people quite understand the degree of transformation uh, in much of uh, Europe since uh, since that period. Uh, and so you still, I mean, not only read about former Soviet republics, but I mean, in, ter- in things such as freedom of speech, freedom of the press, uh, rule of law rankings, my country is ahead of almost all EU countries. I mean, but they still persist this this image of gray people leaving, leading gray lives in gray apartment blocks. It's just not true. Uh, and then people show up and say, oh, my God, I mean, this is your trains are so good and you have some everything is digitized. Uh, but the old perceptions persist. Uh, it has not changed enough. And I, I despair of it changing for another couple of decades um, because I think it's almost sort of hardwired into thinking and has been for so long. Well, I mean, uh, and now, of course, in some sense, a new the division between sort of Western complacency, West European complacency regarding Russia and the and the much tougher position taken by East Europeans, I think, may have even strengthened this feeling that okay, they're different from us. Well, we are different because we actually know what we're talking about, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, because you li- you live in reality, unlike the sort of lotus eating fantasy that a lot of West Europeans, I think, have lived in for the last thirty years. I, we're we're running a little low on on time. Um, by the way, I I want to just say that having visited Tallinn not too long ago, just before COVID, 
I can testify to what you say about, you know, the vibrancy and you know, um, the modernity of, of contemporary, you know, the contemporary Baltic states um, compared to the European uh, kind of, you know, so charoscuro view of everything being kind of, you know, <laughs> rather dull. Um, I wonder if you could comment on kind of another big set of issues that came up at the summit, which is, you know, the the massive effort by the U.S. and allies to supply Ukraine has really thrown into very sharp belief uh, in the U.S. the uh, frailty of our own defense industrial base, the shortage of yeah. munitions that we face, the difficulty we have in replenishing um, the stockpiles that we've drawn down in order to support the Ukrainians. And if anything, I think the situation is you know, worse uh, in Europe with the defense industrial base. And, you know, one of the big headlines out of the summit was we've approved all these new defense plans and we'll be able to move such a number of troops forward, you know, to defend the frontline states against potential Russian aggression in a very short amount of time, blah, blah, blah. You know, that, that's all fine and well, although I think it's going to take a little bit of time even to reach those goals right. that it typically has been in the past. But if they're not armed with anything, it won't really solve the problem. And I, I wonder if you have any thoughts. I mean, you mentioned, you know, bringing in Finland and Sweden, they both have pretty serious defense industries. You got Patria in Finland, you got Bofors in Sweden. What do you think the future of all this is, Thomas? How how is this going to develop in Europe? I was glad to see the one. I mean, one of the things that uh, Estonia or Kaya Kallas proposed was actually adopted by the EU was to devote a billion to producing ammunition, which was not even on the table until she proposed it. And then people said, "No, that's not a bad idea," and they proved it. So, I mean. A billion on 155 millimeter shells would be not bad, but I think that there is broad recognition that they need to do more. The question is, who's going to do it? And so uh, we're not going to, I mean, here I'm hoping uh, sort of even the French put their money where their mouth is regarding strategic autonomy. I mean, if you're going to have any kind of uh, serious defense in Europe, all of the EU or NATO countries must, you know, do their part and actually increase defense expenditure and spend it on buying stuff. I mean, that's it's. Um, I mean, that's one of the uh, the problems if you have a um, all voluntary army is that the bulk of your defense expenditure goes to paying pensions. Um, I mean. <laughs> That's not the way to go. I think that there needs to be a rethink uh, on how we do defense in uh, in Europe and the fact that um, that we better get our act together. I guess in part there is, you know, sort of driving some of it behind, I mean, behind that. this concern is not only Ukraine, but also the prospect of a, of a Trump presidency, which is not, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's possible, and and that would be uh, that would basically mean the end of NATO, um, and uh, uh, and of course, it, you know, Congress as well. I mean, is not. Um, I mean, fortunately, there are enough Republicans in the House to be pro-Ukrainian to to keep things from going completely out of whack. But you know, thinking back on. When my youth and how it was the Republicans who you could always count on to be uh, strong on defense. And now it's the Democrats, which is kind of weird. Yeah, no, well, they're not strong enough. Um, so uh, well, let me use that actually to ask my last question. Uh, you know, you're a, uh, as, as I think our listeners will have figured out for themselves, you're an unillusioned observer of uh, international affairs. We're in the middle of this terrible war. It's almost a year and a half. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions. Will the Ukrainian offensive succeed? Uh, there's, you know, troubling things in American politics. There are troubling things in other countries' politics. You know, are you fundamentally, as you look out 
an optimist, a pessimist, or just kind of in the middle somewhere? Well, I'm colored by my experiences, which is growing up thinking that if Estonia ever became independent, it would be a hugely successful country. And but then, well, I'll this. I was George, the late uh, George Urban, uh, who was editor of the Economist, uh, and he was head of Radio Free Europe, like. 35, 34, 38 years ago, called me to his office when I was an analyst at Radio Free Europe. He said, uh, Thomas, you know, Sony's never going to be independent, but I like what you write. Uh, I think you should retool yourself as an expert on terrorism uh, <laughs> because that's got a future. Now, George was very smart, but I said, no, I think I'm going to stick around and deal with Estonia. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic. And uh, looking at the success of my country, I'm optimistic. And I'm just hoping that other people would also be willing to uh, put as much uh, time and effort into making their country successful, not only the ones in Eastern Europe, which are becoming successful, but also countries in Western Europe to be able to make changes in the way they do things uh, so that they would actually be able to meet the future challenges that will be, I mean, Russia's not going to stop being a, a challenge and China is going to be an ever bigger challenge. Uh, and uh, this kind of tunnel vision combined with myopia uh, <laughs> means you can't see very far ahead, either, either ahead or to the side. And that's what I find is a very disturbing in, um, in Europe, much of Europe today, and I would say countries like mine and basically the Central and East Europeans have to look further ahead and have to look more at what's going on around them than uh, countries that are concerned strictly with uh, their immediate issues. Yeah. Well, that's a great note to end on. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Thomas. Well, this has been tremendous fun talking to the two people I I listen to every every week, and now here I am speaking to them. It's great. <laughs> well, Tomas, it's been great having you, and um, uh, this issue is not going away. So I hope we can have you back periodically to check in and see how how things are going in Europe. Our, our guest today has been Tomas Ilves, the former president of Estonia, former, former minister of Estonia, former ambassador of Estonia to the United States. Um, if you enjoyed this uh, episode of Shield of the Republic, please leave us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts from. <laughs>